not sure. I don't know if you can hear me right now. On the stream or anything. Alright. I know I'm here now. I'm gonna do this well on the stream, and that'll be important later. Um, this is one shot. Timing's gonna start when I gain control. So, there's 30, I believe it's 31 frames between inputting the last text box and gaining control. So I'm gonna do a 3, 2, 1, and then give you the countdown, and then halfway through the countdown I'm gonna jump out of the bed so I can start on time. So that's 3, 2, 1, go. Alright, so, uh, right here you're gonna learn very quickly, wait a minute. Um, two, eight, three, nine. Okay, I was really sure I put in colorblind mode there. Colorblind mode would have not only made that puzzle easier, because I wouldn't have to rearrange the colors, it also would have saved the text box. And that's really all that it saves. It doesn't matter anymore. I'm not actually colorblind, it's just faster and easier. So, immediately you see this game likes to mess with you. You can't really see it on the stream, but there was like a, a Windows-type text box that opened when I was in that computer. Um, and it knew my name by reading the Windows account, the Microsoft account that I'm using on this computer right now. And th that's just a smattering of what this game does. But what this game is, it's an indie kind of puzzle game that was made... Uh, at the tail end of 2016, and it's pretty interesting. It was based off a freeware game of the same name made by, I believe, uh, the artist was a dev on it. I don't remember who made the original version in 2014, uh, but I know that this character existed way before the game, even the freeware version. Like. They are an existing character of an artist. So, I don't know the exact details, but basically it's going to be a puzzle game. And our goal is, we're going to learn a bit of the story in like, a minute. But I'm going to be skipping the story. I'm going to be explaining the story as a heads up. So if you want to play this game, and I recommend you do, uh, be warned. Well, right, right now, we went outside, and now we have fast travel. So, fast travel is a little ability here, uh, where basically, you can go in the menu, select an area you've already been to, and then quickly reappear at that area. And that's going to be insanely useful through the speedrun, because we can just go wherever we want. Alright, so... Uh, there we go. So... This is a prophet bot. He's a character that has prophecies based, kind of like an oracle in a way. And what he tells you is, uh, you are holding the sun right now, which is the light bulb. That's the sun of the world. And you're meant to take it to the top of the tower and return the sun to the world, because that will save it. This, this world is falling apart. You might ask, what just happened? The game just closed itself. Yes. So, we slept in a bed. Sleeping is a weird mechanic where Nico, in each area, is going to get tired and is going to have a dream. And when you go to sleep, Nico sleeping is the game closing. And you can take as long of a break as you want, but obviously you run. You want to get the game open as, much, as quickly as possible. That's why I have Steam in offline mode, so it doesn't try and load anything except for the game. Um... So, coming up right now, we're really just going to be working on making progression. So, right now we know we have a goal of trying to get to the tower, which is at the center of the world. Uh, but we don't really have too much in the way of getting there right now. Um, but we do know, if you, if you play casually and you walk through the docks like a normal person you would see a busted robot in a boat. And that gives you a lead that we might want to fix that robot. 
And you see me right here fast traveling and then fast traveling again. That's a trick called the super fast travel, where basically what I'm doing is I'm going to fast travel. Whatever you fast travel, it, tra it sets you to a specific point on the screen. So by entering a screen, fast traveling off of the screen and then back on the screen um, immediately after, the game... Um, okay, no. So, since when you fast travel, it puts you to a set location on the screen you fast traveled to, sometimes it's faster to fast travel off of a screen and then back on a screen to get to that default fast travel position more than it is to walk to where you would fast travel to. And that's called a super fast travel, and it's useful throughout the speedrun to just cut down walking, which is just more optimization. Because obviously with a game with a lot of text mashing and menuing, and just walking around, you want a lot of optimization. I hold up. Uh, so here we have to make, we have to fix this battery, and then charge it up with the power of the sun. And now we can fix uh, this generator. And so now this computer works. And now the game is going to bend my soul a bit more. Um, there's a note. There's the TXT file in my documents right now that holds a password to this safe. I just opened it, don't worry. That was not the code. No, can you please? I can. I always struggle with this menu. That was a terrible code. Um, one thing uh, myself and the world record holder Durville joke about a lot is bad safe codes, where it takes a lot of up and down inputs to enter the entire code. So, like, for example, last time I ran this game at a marathon, my code was, like, 109149, which is a really fast safe code because you can input most of those numbers within, like, one input, but 266023 is literally, like, ooh, terrible. Anytime you see a 6, a 5, really, it's the worst, and then 6 and 4 aren't too good. 3 and 7 are okay. 2 and 8 is pretty alright, and then 1 and 9, really the optimal code is like 0, but like whatever. And for those wondering, there's not a category where you try and guess that code without generating the password, because the safe actually is tested, and it doesn't work until you get the password. So you have to pr actually progress to that point in order to get the gas mask and stuff. <laughs> And with the gas mask, we can go into that old factory area, which is important, because we're going to... Um... We're going to have to fix that robot in the boat I mentioned earlier by getting some stuff in the area with the weird gas. Which is what I'm doing right now. I'm gonna be collecting air from a vent. And I just collected water from a weird swamp. Um, and now we're gonna do some menu stuff here. That's the crowbar. I thought that was the syringe. Alright. So now we have a wet sponge. Oh yeah, also when we opened the safe, we not only got the gas mask, but we got that journal. And that journal will come into play later. It's a very important item. So now we're just cleaning up the robot, because when we powered the generator, all of the robots turned back on, because the generator powers all the robots, but we still had to clean this robot, and now the robot doesn't remember. Its navigation is just fried right now. So we have to go to Silver here, who's like the head or something, I don't exactly know. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna gloss over some parts of the story in any percent. So there's a post-game chapter to this game. It was released about four, I think 
no, three and a half months after the game's release, there was an update called the Solstice Update, which introduced a whole new post-game chapter to the game, which really finishes the story and explains a lot about the normal game that you might not understand in your first playthrough. I'm going to be explaining some of what's happening in the story, but for the sake of simplicity, I'm not going to be spoiling anything that you learn in the learn or solve um, in this uh, in the post-game chapter. So although, because I do recommend playing this game all the way through, including the post-game chapter, um, but just like I don't think. What am I trying to say here? I do recommend playing this whole game through, and although I do want to make sure people understand the story throughout this run, because this is a very story-based game, and it would be kind of dumb to leave people in the dark about, like, the most major element of this game when I'm running it, I'm gonna keep some stuff quiet about some stuff so that you can still play the game for yourself. Hell, I had a friend who watched my run where I did commentary of both the normal game and the post-game chapter, and still was completely in a loop. So, apparently I do a good job at keeping enough secrets. So that was Calamus. Calamus is my favorite character in the game, but that's not important right now. Because right now, his sister Alula is missing. And that's no good. She's apparently stuck in the ruins, so now we're in the ruins. They live in the ruins, but she's stuck in a different part of the ruins. They're rather big ruins, and you see there's vines here. It, it'll make sense in a second. Also, my microphone settings, just to warn- i just uh, apologizing for my microphone settings. They got messed up, so... Uh, yay for keyboards. That won't be that bad in this game. In Dust, it'll be a lot worse. Honestly. So, this character is Maze. She's gonna die. And so we're gonna try and make her dying moments less stressful by lending her the sun for a little bit. She is a plant. So, we're gonna be going through most of the Glen without the sun. Which, as you know, we kinda need that sun to save the world. So this is... Uh, something. But when Maze is relaxed, the vines uh, retreat, so it gives us access to everything we were missing here, including this puzzle. So these are the vines we saw earlier. Did I actually just do that? Thank you. So this part was one of the things where I was supposed to talk to one of those computers that I talked to in the house and in the barrens. The barrens was that first blue area, by the way. Um, but I know the solution to the puzzle, and unlike the barrens or house puzzle, um, it's that one's the same every time. I don't believe there's any more random puzzles you're going to see in the any percent route. I believe everything now is 100% consistent. Um, so, coming up, if you don't like loud, repetitive sounds, um, I'd recommend muting the game until you see me talk to this, uh, this ram herder again, because, um, the, a lot are about to happen. But if you do like them, well... Yeah. Oh, I'm dumb. Alright, so I'm supposed to trade this guy. This guy's a little trader guy. And I'm supposed to give him the wool. Now that we have that, uh, now we have the, the, like, the die. And so we can... Uh, talk here. 
I just messed up. Okay. So, um, I was, my mashing was not the greatest there. I wanted to say yes to his invitation to come to his house because Calamus has one of the key items to the game. Uh, you noticed in the last area at the end to help the robot with the navigation, we got the amber, the amber, not the ember. Uh, Calamus has basically that item, but for the Glen. Or, Alula does technically, but they live together. And it's the feather here. So, I, unlike... Unlike last time where I explained early on we have a boat robot we need to fix, I failed to explain what the main goal of the Glen is. The main goal of the Glen, obviously, is to get to the next area because that means we're getting closer to the tower. But we have to sign a scroll in order to leave from the Glen to the Refuge, which is the third major area, and the area we're going to be in probably within a minute. Um, and so, for that, uh, we had a bit of a scary encounter there. The sun wasn't lit up, but when we grabbed it, it lit back up. I don't know why it happens when Nico's like that, but it's whatever, really. I don't care. It looks cool. It adds drama. What's there not to like? So, yeah, the main goal here was to, we need to sign a scroll in order to, like, legally be allowed to go to the refuge from here. So we needed to get a pen, because the robot with the scroll does not have a pen. And so we're going to use that feather, that golden feather that was very important, and it was gifted to us to, to, to use as a pen to get into the city. I'm, I'm not kidding. It's okay. We won't lose the feather forever, which is good because we kind of need it in the story. So there we needed to sleep. I mentioned sleeping back in the barrens. I never uh, made the pen. Um, bad, bad. Bad. Found a pen. There we go. Awesome, for those wondering, I'm sorry about the Steam notification at the bottom. I'm just playing on, I'm playing on offline mode, so you won't get, like, people notifications. But because you have to close this game, like, five times or so throughout the run, more than five. I don't know exactly how many times, but more than five. I'm playing on window capture, so you can see every second of it. Next game, I'll be playing game capture in OBS, so you won't have to worry. So now we're in the Refuge which is the third area, third major area. And we're in the sky, because we did climb up a giant building to get here. So we want to get to the ground, the surface. It's called, not the ground. I thought it was called the ground. I'm sorry. Um, and here we're going to meet this major character. This is the Lamplighter. Uh, I think that's their official name. I may be wrong, because I'm always wrong. Uh, but they're mad. They're mad, because the elevator doesn't work. And the button that usually... The magnetized button that usually says ground and sends you to the ground is not working right now. And the lamp lighter needs to go to the ground to light some lamps. So we're going to make a homemade ground button. Don't ask me why this works. You're not going to like it. I don't know. Before you before you actually ask why it works. I don't know. So after we get the uh, tin of coffee, that's where we're going to sleep. Anytime after you get your first major item for the uh, elevator button, that's when the game will allow you to sleep. We learned Nico's favorite food is pancakes here. Great. Alright. So now we're going to... Um, the apartments. The apartments... We're going to get two things. Scissors.
and fridge magnets. We bust into this guy's apartment and, I mean, the door's unlocked. I don't know what it'll say about us going into our apartment, but we can unlock it from the other side. That was locked the first time. We were not allowed in there. Uh, and now, so now we have the three materials that we need to make the button. But I need to go here anyways. I could finish the button right now. Yeah. But. There's one important thing you gotta do when you snip the word ground out of a coffee tin and then put fridge magnets on it. You gotta use tape. I'm in a building. So we took the word ground off of a coffee tin, put fridge magnets on the back of it, and taped it. And after a little bit of glitching, the elevator works. We need to put in the security code, which is the same every time. I- are you kidding me? Uh... Thank you. That was right, that time. I put in a 5 instead of a 4 the first time. Alright. So now, we're gonna be a terrible person and get in the elevator with a stranger. I mean, they know, uh, they've known us for like 3 minutes, so it's fine, right? And we're gonna do an even bigger sin here. So as you see, this game, in its text, it has an effect when, when there's ellipses, the text goes by really slowly. Um, so... If you can resume the awkward silence in the elevator here, but if you talk to- There's three things you can talk to the lamplighter about. You can talk about his job, talk about the city, and talk about the library that we've been told we have to go to. And if you talk about all three of those topics, the elevator ride instantly ends. And it's faster than resuming the awkward silence and just sitting through the bunches of ellipses that the game would usually set you through. So now we're in the refuge city, I'm gonna walk into the back alley to activate the fast travel point for it and then immediately leave it. I'm gonna do that again here. I'm gonna ex and now I'm gonna travel to the back alley. And now I'm gonna walk out here and then go back to the library. Here's where any percent and glitchless are going to diverge. So this is um Kip Skip, also known as library card skip. When you close this game without being in a bed, um, you can close it whenever, and then when you open it, um, it'll play this cutscene where Nico was very scared because it got very dark. That cutscene happens, and it plays over any pre- there's a lot of other cutscene tiles that it plays over, so, um, that it can play over. If there's a cutscene that's activated by walking onto a tile, there's a chance that you can do that glitch to uh, skip the cutscene. So, we skipped a specific cutscene there. We haven't gotten a library card, so usually when we step on that tile, there's a cutscene that initiates a command to push us backwards one tile, because we don't have a library card, so we shouldn't be in the back of the library. But by activating the scared Nico cutscene on that tile, we skip that cutscene and skip the trigger to push us back a tile, and we're allowed into the back of the library early. And we meet, we meet George here, who uh, translates all she can of our journal, and gives us our third major item, a dice. One thing I want to mention about George, we're going to have to do the skip on the way back here. Um... There are six faces of George, obviously, George is a dice. Every time you play this game, you'll see a different George, and it'll, their dialogue will be slightly different to accommodate for, um, because each face has, like, a different mood. There we got six, which I believe is the... We've not timed George, but I like to say that George six is in the faster half, one of the top three in terms of speed. The current speculation is that 3 is the slowest and 5 is the fastest. 5 is also my favorite. But 6 is pretty cool. 6 is the chill one. The 90s one. The 90s and or California skater one. It's up to you. So now we have... So what the journal pages translated there was that... 
To enter the tower, we need three pieces of the old sun, which is basically three items of a thing called yellow phosphor, which is the yellow glow that exists on the amber, the feather, and the dice. So we have three pieces of the old sun. There is other phosphor, blue, green, and red, that you've seen in the lanterns of each area. So phosphor is not a new concept here. Uh, but now we're in the tower, which is weird. So, I'm not 100% sure of the story here, but I'm going to try and tell it to the best of my ability. Um, alright, we have to talk to this computer. The computer's talking to Nico now, it usually just talks to us, and Nico didn't know what they're saying. So, basically, inside this computer, what's been talking to us through this computer has been a character called the Entity. And the Entity doesn't want you taking Nico to the top of the tower, straight up. I'll just tell you that now. Doesn't want you taking Nico. So, I have a program in the background open called underscore, there's like four or five underscores in the name, underscore.exe. Um, and basically, it's the author talking to us. The author is the creator of this world, and so... He's going to try, obviously, to save this world. The entity is trying to save Nico from making a choice. Um, so with that program, we got a clover in our inventory, and if we equipped it, we could line it up. We could line the clover up. Like, there's a clover cutout on the uh, underscore file, and we'd have to constantly move it so it lines up with the clover in our inventory, because when we equip something, it appears in the bottom right. And... It would help us guide through this puzzle, but since I remember the puzzle, uh, I don't need that. So basically, the author's trying to tell you about what the entity's doing. Well, the entity's trying to stop you from getting to the top of the world because he doesn't want you to make the choice. So, this whole time we've been led to believe, um, Nico would return home if they put the sun to the top of the tower, and the sun would save the world. Hopefully. We're not 100% sure if it will. The world might be too late to save anyways. However, we don't know, and what we're learning... So keep in mind, since the author is not talking to us through the... Or not into the game through the file, Nico does not know this yet. What he's telling us is that we cannot save both Nico and the world. We want to save the world. The light bulb is going to have to be shattered. So... I messed up this puzzle, so give me a second. So basically, we're going to be forced to make a choice at the top. Whether we want to save Nico and take them home, or we're going to leave them here, basically as a sacrifice, to put the sun back at the top of the tower and save the world. So, that's where the donation bid war comes in. By the way... Please close that uh, when I warp back to the basement of the house, which is going to be... I'll let you know, but it's in like 10 seconds. And if there's nobody who donated for anything... Alright, so... And the bid war now. Um, so basically there, Explode, if nobody chose anything for the bid war... Just, like, flip a coin or something. I don't know. Heads is return the sun. Tails is return home. So, here the entity is knowing what the author told us that... Um, you know, we can't do both. And although the entity wants to save Nico from us, it can't. It's tail, alright, we'll return Nico home, which is not the ending I usually chose, but actually for a marathon setting, I prefer to choose this ending for one reason. No, I don't mind which ending you end up choosing, Explow. So this is the elevator scene, which is usually one of the hardest scenes in the game. It's where we basically tell Nico that we can't save both the world and uh, them. And we're gonna... Nico's kind of in debate, because he doesn't want to destroy the world, because he loves this world so much, but this... If he saves the world, he dies. 
So time's going to be when I click an ending, which time. All right, I'm going to do something actually kind of weird. Uh, Explode permission to turn on display capture for the sake of this segment. Twenty nine thirty is not a great time. My current PB is twenty seven forty eight, and the current world record is uh. And the current record is 26-26. So I'm not that close, but. I'm going to show off one last thing. So say hello to a really weird site. All right, so. We walk to the bottom of the screen, pass through this wall, finally be home. So Nico's got to return home now, right? The world's gone. That's why we destroyed the sun in this ending. We got to return home, right? That's what I wanted to show. <laughs> now it's just the credits. This is just, you see the world fading here. You'd see the sun lighting everything back up uh, if you chose the other ending. Now, I mentioned the sacrifice though, so this is where the post-game chapter comes in. Even though the w Save the World ending, the Return the Sun ending, just like sees the world light up again. It doesn't exactly mean it's the good ending, and once again, that's where the post-game chapter comes in, but for the sake of, you sh definitely need to play this game yourself, I skipped a lot of good writing and good everything by trying to go fast. B play this game, honestly, it's not very expensive on Steam. It might be on sale right now, but for the most part, yeah, I just really recommend playing this game, doing whatever. Please get it. <laughs> That's all I can really say. Um, so, as the credits are about to end here, I should mention, uh, next run is Dust and Elysian Tale by me. We might take, like, a few minutes break. Because I want to go to the bathroom and stretch, maybe. I don't know. Dust is a very intense game, so I think if it's okay with Explad, we'll take, like, three minutes. All right, I'll see you then.